Over the past 15 years or so, everyone who wasn't a musician, who entered my home or wherever I was residing at the time, had a question for me. And that question was, why do you need so many guitars? Or why do you need so many string instruments? I can only really answer that question by showing firsthand how versatile each one is. I thought it would be a fun idea to make a short video for this channel showcasing the string instruments that I find the most unique, strange, or just plain useful. Before we get into this, I want to emphasize something that's very important. This isn't a musician version of, oh hey, look at all the sports cars in my garage. Each and every one of these things is very unique and I use in some way and even if i only use it once every couple years it still has a lot of value because i'm a professional composer and it may be the thing that needs to get the job done believe it or not i kind of wish i had less i've moved three times in the last four years and i've moved all of these instruments and tried to take care of them while moving which is a huge pain in the butt another thing to take in consideration here is i'm not exactly showing you a collection of vintage les pauls or american-made stratocasters i'm kind of a cheapskate and when i look for a guitar I typically find one that's good enough, then haggle the price down as low as I can go, and then work on it myself or have a luthier work on it to make it play better. I believe that the most expensive instrument that I own is a custom-made Renroco that was cut out of Jacaranda wood into a single piece and luthiered for me, and I believe that set me back something like 17 or 1800 bucks, and that's by far the most expensive thing that you're going to see. Finally, and while unfortunately I don't have it here, I got my first ever guitar in 1984 or 1985. And all I ever wanted for Christmas or birthday or anything was more musical instruments to learn and play on. And then when I became an adult and had my own money to spend on these things, that's pretty much the number one thing I spent money on was gear. Throughout nearly my entire childhood, I would walk around my neighborhood and go through people's trash and collect newspaper and cans, then bring them to a recycling center and get the chump change. And all that chump change change got saved up and then I bought a bunch of gear with it. So when you take into consideration that for most of my adult life when I got paid money for something I would say bah I don't need health insurance but I need an ood and then realize that I'm 38 years old and this has been going on for a very long time by now, you would think my collection would actually be a lot bigger. So in a nutshell, I'm not exactly a trust fund kid that got handed a bunch of string instruments that he doesn't know how to play. This collection has been growing for a very, very long time. And if I acquired anything that wasn't unique, I would usually give it away or sell it and then get something that was unique. So without further ado, let's see some damn instruments. This is a Renroco. It is a bass charango, and they're pretty rare. Due to Gustavo Santeoawa, uh, he's a film composer uh, whose name I'm probably not pronouncing correctly. Due to his popularity using one, people think it's an Argentinian instrument. I'm not entirely sure that it is. I've looked up the history quite a bit and it seems to have originated in Central America. So regardless, they're pretty hard to find. This one I had custom made by Luthier in Bolivia. I would recommend him to other people, but he's kind of fallen off the map and I haven't been able to find him. But he made it out of Jacaranda wood and it is a very full-bodied one in comparison to the other. I'm going to say that right now and for the last couple of years, this is my favorite instrument. Despite it being hard to play and tricky to memorize the tuning for, if you put a little reverb on it, it sounds so incredibly spacious and spiritual. It's just an incredible sounding instrument, and it's a shame that they're so hard to come by. too big for bar chords. Another 
Another really cool thing that I should mention about the Rune Roko is that due to the way that these strings are doubled, the way that you play a string up or down will get you a different effect in some cases. So for example, this middle string, if I play it down, I get that, and if I play it up, I get the higher octave is more prominent. And so if you play like, but if I play that backwards, So that's pretty cool. This is my older Runroco. I've had it for about 15 years. I bought it in Chiapas uh, in south of Mexico near the Guatemalan border in a small music shop. And I just wanted a charango that was bigger and then I got led into this world. This Runroco sounds a bit more like a lute, which is actually pretty cool. The reason I don't play this one that much is because the frets aren't done that well. So I could play something in open string, this fret, this fret, this fret, this fret, and the entire sequence is gonna be a bit out of tune, unfortunately. So. Uh, but it does sound pretty cool. So this is an Alvarez baritone acoustic, and I got it new when I was still in Chicago in like 2011 or so, uh, and I don't remember how much I paid, but it was over $1,000. It's a considerably expensive guitar. The first day I had it, it played so beautifully. And then the second day, it got a little buzzy, and then the third day, some frets didn't work, and by the end of the week, it was unplayable, and it was because the wood still wanted to be a tree and it got brought into a Chicago winter where there's just no humidity, everything's so dry. The guitar was literally unusable until I moved down here where it's much warmer and famously humid and I had a luthier uh, adjust it on two different occasions and it now it finally seems to be coming back to life. It's not easy to play at all, it's really easy to misfret things and it's kind of like playing chords on a bass. So usually these guitars are used for picking and strumming, but it's just so, the strings are so thick that it's hard to actually get the kind of detail that you would get out of a normal acoustic. The low end sounds so rich and beautiful, it's one of my favorites. <laughs> Just hitting that last chord on these lower frets takes like a two second buffer. This is an Egyptian oud. Ugh. I got this probably like 12 or 13 years ago and I was working with a guy named Mark Messing who's an absolutely brilliant musician and uh, he has a PhD in jazz performance. and. I told him uh, at the time while we were working on a project, I was like, hey, I, I bought an oud, by the way. I'm, you know, pretty stoked. And he laughed. He was just like, you know, just like laughed his ass off at me. And I was like, why are, what, what's so funny? And he's like, yeah, you're not going to play the oud. You're just not. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, you're just not going to, you, why would you buy an oud? And I thought it was just like a fretless guitar, essentially. Ouds, as Minnesotans say use microtonal scales. Microtonal scales are extraordinarily hard to learn if you've spent 20, 30 years playing Western music. So 
Not only that, but then you don't have frets. It's hard enough just to remember the normal scales on an instrument like this. I mean, that's actually kind of difficult and I'm impressed that I actually got it so close. But microtonal Eastern scales? It ain't happening. Not in this brain, at least. So I play it infrequently, improperly, and use it like a dumbass. This is a cheap Mitchell acoustic guitar that probably costs 100 bucks, but I really like the action on it. What's unique about it is that it has Nashville tuning. Every other string is an octave up, so it's essentially kind of a tenor guitar. If you have an acoustic or an electric guitar, you can do this. All you have to do is buy Nashville strings or two sets of strings, so it's pretty simple. This was an awesome Christmas gift to me, and it's a tenor guitar. And what I didn't realize is that a tenor guitar is just the first four strings of an acoustic guitar, which I was kind of underwhelmed by, so I don't think I ever even tuned it that way, but I've always used it as an accompaniment to another acoustic guitar piece. <laughs> This is an Olympia Spanish guitar, or a classical guitar, and I own probably four different classical guitars. All of them are cheap. This one is the least cheap. This one probably cost somewhere like 800 bucks at the time. I have no idea how much it's worth now. A good classical guitar costs many thousands of dollars, and I just don't have the money to spend on that. I'm not sure that I would buy a concert-grade classical guitar even if I had the money to spend on it, because I'm not a concert-grade classical guitarist. <laughs> This is why I hate classical music and why I'm glad that I didn't get the scholarship. In terms of fingerboard action and the spacing of the strings, I'm definitely at home with classical guitar. It's the first guitar I've owned and it's just where I'm the most comfortable playing. <laughs> series of weird string instruments that the gringo buys when he goes to Mexico, I got in either Piedras Negras or Acuna, somewhere in northern Mexico, and I don't know what it is. I don't know what the tuning is. It has eight strings, uh, so three sets of two, and then just single strings on the end, and I don't know what the tuning is, so I'm kind of winging it. And it looked very similar to a Renroco, so I got really excited and was like, I don't care, I'll buy it. It has a name, and the guy in the music store actually told me what it was, but my Spanish isn't that good, and more importantly, my memory isn't that good, and I probably forgot it in the next 30 minutes, and I've been searching ever since. I really want to know what this is. So if anyone knows what this strange eight-string Mexican guitar-like instrument is, please let me know, because I actually really like it, and I'd like to buy a nice one that plays better and learn how to play it. This is my sitar. I ordered it. I've had it for a very long time, and I think it's on its way out. I think it's just sort of reached the sitar's lifespan, because I, I, I probably didn't pay more than 700 bucks for it, and it's just kind of a crappy sitar. The <laughs> funny thing about the sitar is that there's an egg up there, and there's a goose down there, and they uh, adjust the fine-tuning of the strings, so like... 
goose down. Another weird thing about sitars that you should know is that if you want to learn traditional songs on the sitar, there's different ragas, and those ragas mean tunings. And there's different tunings for every type of different song. So that means that you have to retune it when you play a new song. And on a guitar, that's like, okay, that's kind of a pain in the butt, but I'll do it. On a sitar, unless you really know what you're doing, that's like a two hour undertaking, um, especially if you have a less than a thousand dollar crappy sitar, because you have all these resonator strings down here, which are gonna be awfully out of tune. Yeah, I just stopped bothering because it's so hard to keep in tune. So when I do spend all the time tuning it, it has to be for a session. Otherwise, I'm not bothering and therefore I'm not practicing that much. A couple of years ago, I had a show scheduled at a festival in India and I was very excited to spend a month in the country uh, gathering and playing various musical instruments that I wasn't familiar with and also hopefully buying and bringing home a new sitar. Unfortunately, like half the country lost power right after it was confirmed and the uh, festival got canceled. So, boo. <laughs> So remember when I just hit this note here? Okay, watch what happens when I press this fret normally. So the tone of each fret is affected by how hard you press it. All right, and then you can also, of course, bend it. And then it's kind of a, a mixture between both. So I could also press it hard when I'm doing this. one fret where I'm getting all those notes from, and that's really intimidating, but also cool. As if I wasn't already making this sound too complicated for me with the resonating strings and the different ragas, well, guess what? You can just move all the frets around, however you like, and the, there's different frettings for different songs. You essentially have to make a new instrument every time you play a new song. So. Actual sitar players, I salute you. You are a hero. Some years ago, in January, I drove from Chicago to New Orleans and brought an acoustic guitar. And the changes in humidity or temperature or environment or whatever made it close to this tuning. And I just decided I'm going to write music only in that tuning for a bit. And I ended up making an album called Louisiana Morning that's just based 100% in that tuning and even has orchestral elements in it based in that tuning. And since then, I've always had an acoustic guitar, and this is my favorite acoustic guitar, I've always had one that just stays in that tuning because it's my favorite tuning. This is a Blue Ridge acoustic, and I had a luthier do some modifications to the fretboard and put a bone nut on it, and I think it is the best acoustic guitar I've ever played in my life. And I am extraordinarily lucky to have that at a price point that I can afford. <laughs> This is a Young's brand, Chinese banjo of some sort. I don't know the proper name for it. And I've never used it for anything other than just dicking around like. It sounds like I actually know what I'm doing, but I absolutely don't. It has Python skin or something, which is pretty cool. I don't know if this particular model of the instrument is a piece of garbage or if the fretting scales are just bonkers, but. I can't really write anything with that. Not to say that you can't write something with that scale. This brain can't. This is a big old Dean fretless bass, and I've had it for a very long time, like 17 years or something. It's on its way out, unfortunately, but it's about as close as you're going to get to that jazzy upright bass sound as you're going to get without having an upright double bass. Over the years, the strings and bridge have gained kind of a buzz, which is usually a really bad thing, but with a fretless acoustic bass, it's actually pretty cool sounding. Also, anything without frets has awesome harmonics.
super old, cheap, fake version of a Rickenbacker bass, and it's garbage. It is literally garbage. I found it in a dumpster in like 1999, and it is my garbage bass, and every now and then, it's nice to have a garbage bass in your track. This is my favorite bass. This is the one you hear the most in my music, and this is the one that I play the most, and it is a Fender recreation of Jaco Pistorius's fretless jazz bass. It has this incredible ability to sing, and that really shines when you put it through a grid preamp, which we're not right now, but check this out. Ooh, this guitar is absolutely incredible with harmonics, and that's something that defined Jaco Pistorius' career. He even used uh, artificial harmonics in his music with the bass, which was kind of a first at the time. And when his initial solo record came out in the late 70s, or was it early 80s, sometime right around then, he has a track called Portrait of Tracy. And Portrait of Tracy is almost all harmonics, and it's just solo bass guitar. And people thought at the time that it was an electric piano or something. They didn't even realize he was playing the bass. This little melody I'm playing is from Portrait of an Idiot trying to play Portrait of Tracy. I've heard live recordings of him playing it where he strikes all these at once. I don't know how he does it. And you listen to Jacko's Portrait of Tracy in his original recording of it, he strikes this harmonic that I've just never heard in my life. And to this day, I've heard probably a hundred different people play Portrait of Tracy on YouTube, people far better than myself, and they still haven't even come near hitting it with that kind of perfection. At some point in the late 1990s, I walked into a guitar center and said, hey, I only have 200 bucks, what's the cheapest bass you have? And one of my options was this D. Armand, uh, I don't even know the, doesn't even say a model number, but it was crafted in Korea. So I just needed a bass for something I was working on. So a couple years later, I'm digging the bass, I'm playing it quite a bit, and I decide to buy a good bass guitar, like an actual bass player's bass. So I buy a Yamaha for six or 700 bucks and give this one to a friend. And about a year later, I'm, I'm, I'm craving the light weight of this and I'm just craving the, the high pitch slappiness of it. And I end up you know, buying a different bass, I think for even more money, and over the years, I finally asked my friend, I'm like, hey, remember that crappy D. Armand bass? And he's like, yeah, I, I lent it to a friend or, you know, and it's been there for a couple of years. And, I'm, and so I tried tracking it down and I finally got it back. Oddly enough, almost a decade later, this is the only fretted bass that I keep in my studio. I have some other ones in cases and whatever else, but this is the only one that I actually use. This is a Washburn that I got for a really good price, but I wasn't a massive fan of after playing it for a bit, and I also didn't like the way it looked, so I sacrificed it. I took all the frets off, and it is a fretless six-string electric guitar, uh, so things like chords are very, very difficult, but if you're playing only one or two strings or something monophonic, it sings in a way similar to how that Jaco Pistorius bass sings, but obviously, you know, an octave or more up. Mm -hmm. 
this here is a nice looking Ibanez art core that I bought solely for the purpose of touring because my favorite guitar that I've ever owned and the best playing guitar that I've ever owned, I toured around the world with it for many years and effectively got to the point of almost destroying it and decided, hey, I'm gonna use my not favorite guitar for touring. The things that really attract me about this guitar is that it plays well. It's very versatile. It can play rock stuff and solos and stuff like that because it's a bit modeled after a Les Paul, but it's also a semi-hollow, so you could play more jazzy things, which I'm more familiar with. Finally, it's not all that expensive and it's very common. So if I were in Dallas, Texas, and somehow my guitar got destroyed, I could probably find another one of these within a day, slap a new MIDI pickup on it, and I'm back in business. <laughs> There's not really anything particularly special about it. I just wanted to include it in this video, maybe as a placebo test against my next guitar. Is this guitar? Last but not least, we have what once was a Schecter. It's so not a Schecter anymore that I've very much thought about scratching the logo off. In like 2002 or so, a friend of mine who worked at Guitar Center called me and said, hey man, we just got this weird, Frankenstein-esque guitar in with MIDI pickups, do you want to see it? And I already had a MIDI pickup on my guitar at the time and I, I wasn't that excited about it, but I decided to check it out anyway. And I find this weird Schecter with Bartolini pickups, uh, humbuckers, and uh, you know, of course the MIDI pickup on it. And I played it and my mind was just blown. The action is so spooky good that when you're playing through an amp, you don't even need to strum to get notes out of it. Even when it's a live string feed through the MIDI pickup, it somehow sounds beautiful, but the actual Bartolini pickups is what makes it sound incredible. If you search the flashbulb live, chances are you'll see an image or a video with me holding this very guitar because I've toured with it for 15 years or so. Over the years, it's been abused and repaired over and over again, and I finally just retired it because I still want to record with it. So let's have a send off with, in my opinion, the best sounding and playing guitar. I've ever touched. Despite it being kind of difficult to play tiny instruments and gigantic instruments all in one sitting, I'm glad I made this video and it reminded me that I do have some upkeep to doing. I'm about to go solder in a new pickup and uh, repair some things on some of these. So thanks for being part of my realization of that. And as always, if you enjoyed this video, subscribe to the channel and let me know in the comments if there's anything you want me to cover in the future. Bye.